Hi, Jerry Jenkins here talking about all things writing, this time on the much misunderstood counsel to show and don't tell. Is that an adage that immediately makes you roll your eyes because you've heard it so much? Or does it frustrate you because you still don't know what it means or how to make it work? Trust me, you're not alone. I hear from writers all over the world who want to know the difference between showing and telling and why it's so important. Once you get it, it seems simple, and you'll never forget it. But until you do, figuring it out and mastering it can be one of the most frustrating parts of the writing process. So how important is it? Important enough to make or break your chances of an agent or publisher's acquisitions editor noticing your work. So let's see if I can clear up a few things and make simple for you the art of showing. First, let's talk about the difference between showing and telling. Telling readers something simply spoon-feeds them information rather than giving them a role in the reading experience and deducing things for themselves. For instance, maybe you tell them Jim was tall or Jim was angry, or cold, or tired. That's telling. You've left readers with nothing to do but take in facts. So how to involve them in the experience? Let them deduce the facts and come to their own conclusions. Here's what I mean. Don't just tell your readers your character is tall. Show them by saying his girlfriend craned her neck to look up at him or that he has to bend his knees to fit into a group picture. Rather than telling your readers your character is angry, show his face flushing, his voice rising, or his slamming the table with his fist. Then you don't have to tell anyone he's angry. Don't tell me your heroine is cold. Show me by having her raise her collar, tighten her scarf, shove her hands deep into her pockets, or turn her face from the biting wind. Don't just say your character is tired. Have him yawn, groan, or stretch. Maybe his eyes are puffy, his shoulders slumped. Another character might ask, didn't you sleep last night? You look shot. Instead of telling readers the season, show leaves crunching beneath your character's feet. To help you avoid merely telling, first, use dialogue. Dialogue allows the story to emerge naturally rather than your having to spell out every detail. Here's an example of admittedly egregious dialogue that tells. Although it's exaggerated, believe me, I often see stuff this bad. Just because you're in this hospital because you were nearly killed in that wreck when Bill was driving, that doesn't mean you shouldn't forgive him. Instead, show by rendering realistic dialogue, the way people really talk, like establish a friend in the hospital and have them say, what are you going to do about Bill? He feels terrible. He ought to. Well, has he visited? He wouldn't dare. Give readers credit to catch on. What actually happened can emerge as the story unfolds. That allows readers the fun of participating in the experience of deducing the story. Okay, another way to avoid telling is to engage your reader's senses. Now, we all know the five senses are sight, hearing, smell, taste, and touch. Sight is automatically engaged in readers because they see in their mind's eye what you render on the page. Hearing is engaged when characters engage in dialogue as well as when you describe any sound. It's the other three senses we writers often neglect to the detriment of our final product and the enjoyment of our readers. Now, I confess that I often neglect taste, smell, and touch in my initial rough draft writing. I often have to remind myself with a sticky note to inject an appeal to those senses during my editing and rewriting stage. Admittedly, these shouldn't be shoehorned in so they draw attention to themselves, but where possible, have a character smell something from the kitchen or in the garden 
or at the ocean. Have something they eat make them pucker or sigh with pleasure or grimace. As for touch, maybe your character grows goose flesh in the cold, runs his finger across a rough piece of wood, feels the carpet on his cheek when he lies on the floor, or feels the chill of a smooth stone she's pulled from a lake. All right, another way to avoid telling is to be on the lookout for state of being verbs. You may have been taught in school, as I was, to memorize such verbs like is, am, are, was, were, be, being, been, has, have, had, etc. If you weren't taught these or have forgotten them, just Google state of being verbs and download the list. Then ferret them out of your work and delete as many as you can. Active verbs will make your prose more direct and powerful and will help trigger the theater of your reader's mind. Once again, giving them an active role in experiencing your story. A woman once told me she was thrilled to find a book she'd cherished as a child. She eagerly thumbed through it, looking for all the beautiful paintings she remembered, only to discover the book had no illustrations. The author had so engaged the theater of her young mind that she had imagined those very real impressions. Notice the difference between the man was standing on the platform and the man stood on the platform. Rather than Jim is a lover of country living, you could write Jim loves country living. Instead of there are three things that make me feel the way I do, try three things make me feel the way I do. Okay, another way to show and not tell is to use an active voice rather than a passive one. I could explain active versus passive voice by telling you about subjects and objects and verbs and which is acting versus being acted upon, avoiding adverbs and all that. But unless you excelled at diagramming sentences, that's likely to sound like gibberish. The easiest way to spot passive voice and change it to active is to weed out most state of being verbs and also often by the word by. So instead of the party was planned by Jill, make it active. Jill planned the party. Instead of the wedding cake was created by Ben, make it active. Ben created the wedding cake. Instead of the Little League team was awarded trophies by the coaches, you could say the coaches awarded trophies to the Little League team. Avoid passive construction and you'll set yourself apart from much of your competition and give your writing a powerful ring of clarity. All right, my last tip for how to avoid telling is to resist the urge to explain. Give readers credit. They're smarter than we think they are. Do we really have to write, she glanced up at the clouds in the sky? Don't we think readers will assume that if she's looking at the clouds, she's looking up? and that clouds are in the sky? Of course, if she were on a mountaintop, she might be looking down on the clouds, but we'd clarify that. Otherwise, simply state she glanced at the clouds. Instead of writing, Joe walked through the open door, just write, Joe walked through the door. The fact that it's open is obvious. The last person I read of who appeared despite a closed door was Jesus. Okay, so now we come to a common question. When, if ever, is telling acceptable? Too many so-called experts hold this show-don't-tell rule inviolable. They speak in absolutes. Always show, never tell. Then when we see places where telling actually works better than showing, others feel the need to declare that the show-don't-tell rule has become obsolete. The fact is, it's a good rule and should almost always be followed almost always. But here's an example of when narrative summary works better than showing. Say you merely need to get your character to another location. Nothing happens on the way. It's just a matter of traveling from one place to the other. Religiously following the show-don't-tell rule would force you to invest several paragraphs 
showing every aspect of the trip from packing, dressing, getting a cab to the airport, going through security, boarding the plane, arriving, being met at the airport, riding to the new location, etc. Boring. In this case, I'd simply tell, in narrative summary, that my character spent the day traveling from his home to, say, Washington, D.C. for a meeting. Then, because that's where the crucial stuff happens for the plot, I'd show that. If he then has to return before more significant action returns, I'd render that as quickly as, back home two days later, comma, he began doing whatever it was he had to do based on that meeting that came in Washington. So let me show you some good show-don't-tell examples. Here's an example from Charles Frazier's novel, Cold Mountain. The hayfield beyond the beaten dirt of the school playground stood pant-waist high and the heads of grass were turning yellow from need of cutting. The teacher was a round little old man, hairless and pink of face. He owned but one rusty black suit of clothes and a pair of old over-large dress boots that curled up at the toes and were so worn down that the heels were wedge-like. He stood at the front of the room, rocking on the points. The reason this works, besides the fact that Fraser layers the description into the action, is that he makes you forget your reading. Don't draw attention to the writing itself or to you as the writer. Get out of the way of your art, your content. In Arthur Conan Doyle's The Sign of Four, here's John Watson's observation of Sherlock Holmes. So swift, silent, and furtive were his movements, like those of a trained bloodhound picking out a scent, that I could not but think what a terrible criminal he would have made had he turned his energy and sagacity against the law instead of exerting them in its defense. I want to keep reading, don't you? One final example comes from Beloved by Toni Morrison, wherein she brilliantly condenses many years into one paragraph. Men and women were moved around like checkers. Anybody baby Suggs knew, let alone loved, who hadn't run off or been hanged, got rented out, loaned out, brought up, brought back, stored up, mortgaged, won, stolen, or seized. So baby's eight children had six fathers. What she called the nastiness of life was the stock she received upon learning that nobody stopped playing checkers just because the pieces included her children. It's writers like those who create novels we prefer over their movie adaptations. They trigger readers to create their own visuals. Readers' minds are far more imaginative than anything Hollywood can put on the screen. That's why it's worth the effort to master the art of showing rather than telling. All right, that's all for today. If you found this video helpful, please like it, comment on it, share it, and subscribe to my page. I wish you the best with your writing, and I'll see you next time.